Hello, and welcome back to The Art of the Matter. We've entered the season of Epiphany, and as we discussed last week, Epiphany has to do with the various ways in which Jesus was revealed to the world at the time of his birth and then in his early ministry. Last week, we emphasized the smallness of these epiphanies. They don't occur on the brightly lit stage of the world, nor do they necessarily involve great and important people, although perhaps the revelation of Jesus to the wise men might be considered a, as an exception, as they seem to be men of high learning and brought the kinds of gifts that only people of great wealth could afford. But generally speaking, the various scenes in which Jesus is revealed take place off the world's stage and in the midst of humble folk like shepherds and fishermen. In fact, today's lectionary reading and that of next week both concern Jesus appearing to fishermen, and in one case, to a rather skeptical gentleman lounging under a fig tree who was inclined to think that nothing good could ever come out of Nazareth. Sadly, there is very little art that takes up this theme of Jesus appearing to his first disciples and calling them to follow him. So today's session will be on the short side, and you just might be relieved. I'm going to concentrate on just one work of art this week. It's by Marco Basaiti, who worked in Venice in the 16th century. This work dates from 1510. It's a large oil painting measuring 12 and a half feet high and eight and three quarter feet wide. So it's quite impressive. It was designed for the high altar at a Carthusian church in Venice that no longer exists. The church was named after St. Andrew who features prominently in this image. In fact, he is the only person in the picture who looks out directly at us, drawing us into the scene. Jesus is standing next to him in blue and reddish pink, and next to him is Andrew's brother, Simon Peter. The three men who are rising from the boat on the right, looking from right to left, are Zebedee in red, his son John in mauve and white, and next to him is Zebedee's other son, John's brother, James, who kneels before the Lord and before Peter. Well, and Andrew. Zebedee has been operating a fishing business, and he is just now losing his two prime fishermen, who are choosing to become fishers of men instead. It's fascinating to me to see how the composition of this painting underscores the idea of being at a crossroads. The two channels of water above flow toward the fishermen from opposite directions, as do the lines of the two boats moored at the bottom of the painting. The painter is subtly suggesting that this is a turning point in the lives of these men, when they will have to decide whether they will remain fishermen or set out on an adventure with Jesus that will take them in a very different direction. A direction that is perhaps hinted at by the way the entire top half of the painting features hills and valleys, steep mountains and ravines, and eventually a bright, although distant, light. We might also note that St. Andrew died a martyr's death on a cross shaped like an X. And St. Andrew, being the patron saint of Scotland, the national flag of Scotland bears his cross, otherwise known as a saltier. Perhaps in featuring a crossways composition, the painter is also suggesting the way in which St. Andrew will die. One of the other fascinating features about this painting is the play of hands amongst all the central characters. Each pair of hands seems to gesture in opposition one to the other hand. Andrew himself puts one hand to his chest while his other hand stretches forth in a gesture suggesting, wait, stop. 
James, kneeling at his feet, holds one hand pressed to his chest, while his other is open and reaching toward Jesus. Behind him, Brother John gently touches his hand to his heart, while the other stretches backwards towards his father Zebedee, whom he will soon leave behind. Zebedee himself, on the right in red, points in the direction of Jesus, while his other hand reaches toward his son, as if to hold him back a little bit longer. Even Jesus' hands convey different messages. One is open in a gesture of blessing and beckoning, while the other is closed around his outer garment, wrapping it around his body. Peter, on the far left, seems to point forward or toward Jesus, while at the same time his other hand wraps a tight fist around a piece of cloth. You might ask, what does all this hand jive mean? Well, to my way of thinking, this is a beautiful way to convey the opposing forces that are in play whenever we are at a crossroads and must make a decision, especially a decision involving a call we sense is coming from the Lord, or from the Holy Spirit. We wonder, like little Samuel in the Old Testament reading for today, awakening three times in the night when someone out of the darkness calls his name, we wonder where this call is coming from and what it could possibly mean. Is it really coming from God? And if so, am I willing to give up whatever it is I'm engaged in in order to follow the call? There is almost always a push-pull going on when a decision is being made. If you and your family have been fishermen all your lives, what will be the cost of leaving that behind to follow a man you have barely met? Of course, not all decisions are quite so radical as that. It may be that we are being called to a gentle course correction, a reorientation after a period of wandering off the path or generally feeling lost in the fog. I don't know about you, but I think many of us have felt more disoriented in the past year than we have felt in a long, long time. The markers that normally punctuate our days and weeks and seasons and rituals suddenly vanished, and many of us found ourselves wandering around wondering what day it was. I tell myself it's Blur's Day because the week has turned into a complete blur, punctuated only by the day the garbage or the recycling needs to be put out to be collected. And we've been going through terrible turmoil as a nation, with violent insurrection in Washington, D.C., and more apparently planned in capitals across the country. None of us have lived through a time like this, although historians tell us that our country has been rocked by similar violence and division before. Still, it's new to us, just like a pandemic is new to us, and working from home and trying to assume responsibility for our children's education and keeping a safe distance from all the people we so want to hold and touch. So we're disoriented. Maybe we're at a crossroads. What's the best way forward? Like the disciples, we try to discern if Jesus is calling us to something new or to a way of doing things differently. One of my favorite verses to turn to when I feel that I'm lost or drifting is Jeremiah 6, verse 16, which I've cited before in these talks. It reads, This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Stand, which is to say, stop, pause, reflect. Look, keep your eyes open. Be alert, as Jesus is always urging us. Be alert for signs and hints. Ask, 
Seek out the Lord, study the scriptures, consult with godly friends, and ask for guidance. And then ask again, which is to say, persist in your quest. And when the answer comes, and you see the path before you, have the courage to walk in it. Next week's lectionary takes up this same subject of the calling of the disciples. And since we've treated that today, and there is almost no artwork to highlight it, I'll take a break until we come to more Sunday readings that have inspired great or truly interesting works of art. In the meantime, stay safe, be well, and be blessed. And I'll see you soon.